sir. So I'll start with her question on Radha's character. What was so unique about her character that made you write, compile and edit a book solely dedicated to her? Well, you know, Radha is an amazing character uh, in the entire mythic treasure of India. You take all the goddesses, the semi-goddesses, and uh, all the celestial women, semi-celestial women, the Shala Banjika, the Saraswadaris. Radha occupies a unique place. Uh, she's obviously a mythic character. And I think it's important to leave her at that. Because when you try and conflate myth and history, then it loses its charm and then all kinds of questions come up, unnecessary questions. So she is born in from poetry. She's Kavya Mai. But then she traverses dynasties, uh, philosophic systems, different parts of India, and emerges in different ways at different times. And it still is a very endearing character or person or whatever you want to call it. Call her. So when we talk of any mythic event or mythic person, we cannot totally divorce it from socio-historic conditions of the day. This applies also to our wisdom traditions, all our philosophic systems. Uh, some hold the view that philosophic systems just arise from nowhere, de novo as they say. Uh, I hold the view, along with many others, that philosophic systems, mythic beings, mythic events, arise as a result of or on a background of certain socio-political historic conditions of the day. So when we talk of Radha, Radha really appears for the first time in her concrete form in Jaidev's Geet Govinda. And that's about the 12th century, roughly. So we need to examine what was going on in the 12th century. Why did Radha appear at that time in her concrete uh, form? Why not earlier, why not later? And I think one of the main reasons, according to me, why Radha appears in Jaidev's Gita Govinda in the 12th century is that there was, at that time, in our philosophic traditions, kind of a shift from Advaita to Dvaita. Uh, the Advaita traditions, which is which started in the Upanishads, uh, held a sway over the Hindu mind, the Indian mind, for well over a thousand years. Uh, that was the mainstream philosophic system. And that is what happened in the Bhagavad Purana. Bhagavad Puran, which is roughly the 9th century, is the story, particularly the 10th book of the Bhagavad Puran, is the story of Krishna's romantic episodes, romantic involvement with the gopis of, uh, of Vrindavan. But these are all gopis, there is no Radha there. And it's very important to understand that. Uh, the people who wrote the Bhagavad Puran, who were probably Tamil Brahmins, because the Bhagavad Puran really is an outgrowth of Tamil Bhakti poetry. They could have put Radha there if they wanted to, as the prime beloved of Krishna. But why did they not? That is the question. Because Radha as a character was lurking in the minds of people for a long, long time, for centuries, for millennia. The folk literature, the tribal literature, uh, always had that beloved of the flute playing person, as it were. So, the Bhagavad Puran does not have Radha in it. And for a very good reason. Because the Bhagavad Puran is an Advaitic document. It was important for the Bhagavad Puran to remain Advaitic and not break away from the Upanishads. Bhagavad Puran does break away from the Vedic because the way the, the, the Dashamaskanda begins by Krishna lifting the Govardhan mountain and going against the dictates of Indra itself sends a signal 
that the Vedic hegemony on the Indian mind was coming to an end. And it was time to put away with the Vedic yajnas, the rituals and so on, and commence another way of, of, uh, of looking at ourselves, looking at the, our traditions, our wisdom, our philosophy. And therefore, the Bhagavad Purana remains Advaitic. Although it is erotic uh, and life-affirming, so the Bhagavad Purana was the coming together of three streams of thought. The Northern Advaitic Upanishadic stream, the erotic stream of the tribal people, and the life-affirming stream of the Aham, Tamil words. But yet there was no room in that for Radha, because it had to maintain that Advaitic, that non-dual position, which comes through very nicely at the end of the Rasa Lila. When Krishna disappears, the gopis are left longing for Krishna and then discover Krishna within their own selves. So that must be said even before we start talking of Radha. But then once the Bhagavad Puran comes and even the Pushtimag Vaishnavism of Vallabhacharya, the guru out of it, and Vallabhacharya also maintains an Advaita. He calls it Shuddha Advaita. He departs slightly from the Bhagavad uh, because he, he does not totally subscribe to the Bhagavad, although it's the, his, his doctrine, Pushtimag doctrine, is an outgrowth of the Bhagavad. But by that time, 12th century comes along, the hold of Advaita on the Hindu mind, the Indian mind, was decreasing. Because the dualistic traditions of Nimbarka and Madhvacharya were taking hold. That Advaita, at the end of the day, is not an easy doctrine. Because in Advaita, you are completely eliminating uh, the object and relying completely on the subject and eventually your own subjective presence is also eliminated and you sort of, you, it dissolves in the Supreme Self, the Paramatman. That's not easy to do, it's easy to talk about because human as we are, we want to hang on to our objective being, our ego, our mind, our intellect and so on. And therefore the dualistic traditions of Madhvacharya and Nimbarka uh, were sprouting up, they were taking hold of the Indian mind. Uh, we were enjoying the dualistic traditions. It is in that, that background that Jaidev comes along uh, and introduces Radha as a principal character of the Gita Govinda. Now Jaidev was also came from a background of Bengal and Orissa, which was the Shakti tradition, very strong in Bengal and Orissa. Uh, mainly, although in other parts of India as well. And therefore he introduces Radha as the beloved of Krishna, but underlying the character of Radha in the Gita Govinda is the whole Shakti tradition. That Radha is not only the beloved of Krishna, but she is the Shakti figure. It's there in a seminal form. And it was later picked up by Chaitanya, which I'll come to a little bit later. So, why Jaidev chose to wrote about, the, about Krishna and so on is hard to answer. Uh, obviously, Krishna had made an appearance in the Bhagavad Purana, the romantic Krishna. Uh, where did he come from? We don't know. Probably a composite figure of the erotic person, the tribal person, the flute playing person, the romantic person. Uh, and it all gets concretized in the, in the, in the body and the persona of Krishna. So Jaidev taps into that, uh, but refuses to remain Advaitic. Wants a consort, wants the beloved of Krishna, and he chooses Radha. Now, a lot of questions are asked as to why Radha, what is the meaning of the term Radha, and so on. Some people have suggested that vaguely in the Bhagavad Puran there is a seminal Radha, a gopi who is in love with Krishna and Krishna has a special affection for her and they disappear and so on. So there is that seminal suggestion of Radha in the Bhagavad without her name. But Jaidev brings her in, the Kitu Govinda. 
uh, and in no uncertain terms. I mean, she is the all powerful beloved of Krishna, who not only is in love with Krishna but humanizes him, really brings him to his knees, as it were. Uh, and once she appears in the Gita Govinda, she never leaves. She is there uh, to the present day. Jaydev introduces the whole dualistic idea of Radha, Radha in love with Krishna. And the interesting thing is that when there is a dualistic relationship between Radha and Krishna, what are we? In the Bhagavad, we are all gopis, man, woman and child. We are all females and we are all gopis, directly in love with Krishna. And that remains the hallmark of Pushtimag Vaishnavism. That all the Pushtimagis are essentially gopis in love with Krishna. When Radha comes as the main beloved of Krishna, something interesting happens. Can we love Krishna as the gopis did in the Bhagavad? Can we not? Because Radha is his principal beloved. Where do we fit in? Uh, how do we read the Gita Govinda? How do we, we, we become a part of Krishna's love at that point? In the Bhagavad Gita Govinda. So here, Jayadev introduces the character of the Sakhi. There is no Sakhi in the Bhagavad. This Sakhi is the person who is the intermediary between Radha and Krishna. She is the one who arranges meetings. She is the one who carries, carries messages. She is the one who assuages one or the other when they have a fight and so on. And therefore, we become the Sakhi in the Gita Govinda. And that is a very important difference. We who participate in the Gita Govinda cannot be the Gopi. We cannot directly love Krishna. We have to love Krishna through Radha. But Radha is the consort, Radha is the Shakti. So that whole idea comes in very strongly in the Gita Govinda. Changes the way, the whole romantic uh, relationship evolves from the Gita Govinda. And it is Chaitanya who picks that up. Chaitanya makes Radha the, uh, the, the Shakti and the Devi and the consort of Krishna. Not only that, but he also insists and says and behaves that all of us must imitate Radha. Uh, we must placate Radha. He even dressed himself like Radha. Uh, so we don't have direct access to Krishna. It's only through the through Radha and we as Sakis of, of Radha who can then have access to Krishna. So already couple of hundred years after the Gita Govind, uh, the character of Radha has changed. She is no longer just a beloved of Krishna in a romantic poem. Uh, Chaitanya converts a very beautiful Gita Govinda into a theological text. Uh, it is no, for Jayadeva, Gita Govinda is just a romantic poem. He had no idea that within a hundred years of his writing the Gita Govind, it would spread all over India. It is amazing how the Gita Govind spread. It is amazing how within a couple of hundred years of the Gita Govinda uh, being, as it were, written, created and so on, paintings were started. Uh, the whole miniature tradition uh, picks up the Gita Govind and starts making very beautiful paintings for the Gita Govind. Very interesting idea that how quickly it spread. Uh, it is said that next to the Bhagavad Purana and probably the Rasika Priya, the Gita Govind is the most uh, uh, celebrated text in the whole Krishna tradition. So there you are. There is there is Jaidev, there is Radha, there is the Gita Govind, and that is where we should start looking. So, in a sense, it's her from the Nayaka in the Gita Govinda. She becomes like a Devi with Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Correct. 
becomes a Devi. Vallabha Charya's Prashtamak Vaishnavism is still going on quite nicely. Jai Dev, although gave a different twist to the whole romance of Krishna, does not inhibit the Prashtamakis. They are going on quite nicely and strongly in Gujarat and Rajasthan. Most of the Rajput kings uh, were Prashtamak Vaishnavas. So, as it were, on the west coast of India, Pushtamak Vaishnavism is progressing quite nicely with its headquarters at Nathadwara near Udaipur. Uh, and here we are on the eastern side of India with Chaitanya uh, taking his stand on the Gita Govind and uh, creating Radha as a Devi. And the whole Shakta tradition then springs up on the east coast of India, Bihar, Orissa, mainly. Uh, and there are interesting conflicts that take place between the Pushti Margis and, and the Chaitanya. They, they are also called the Gaudiyas of Bengal. It's also called Bengal Vaishnavism as opposed to Pushti Mark Vaishnavism. They progress independently but there are conflicts because Chaitanya's Gaudiya Vaishnavism was a very proselytizing kind of Vaishnavism. Uh, they wanted they wanted converts, they wanted to spread their word. And uh, Chaitanya himself deputes two of his disciples, Jiva Goswami, Rupa Goswami, to go to the present day Mathura and kind of recreate Vrindavan, the mythic Vrindavan that existed in the Bhagavad. Uh, they want to recreate it in actuality. So all the stories of Radha and where, where she was born, like Barsana and so on, or come up in the present day Vrindavan. But that was the creation of the Gaudiyas. And the Gaudiyas wanted to come down and take over Pushtimag, uh, the Nathadwara tradition. But they were resisted, they were thrown out of uh, the Nathadwara area. Even Kota, present day Kota and, and, and Udaipur and so on, remained staunchly Pushti Marvis. They couldn't come. Whereas they got a stronghold in the areas around Jaipur uh, and the Gaudiya tradition became very strong there with a number of temples that came up. Where Radha is present as a consort. But the interesting thing is that even there Radha does not come as a murti, as an icon. She is suggested sometimes by a mound of earth on which some jewels are kept and so on. Uh, the iconic Radha is a very modern uh, development. Radha is an icon like Radha Krishna that we are so used to seeing in calendar prints, uh, in the temples, Madhubani, uh, the Radha Krishna divine pair. Uh, but the iconic development of Radha is very, very late. Uh, to go back for a minute to Pushtimag and Nathadwara, even there, the Radha is suggested. She doesn't appear. And she's again suggested through her clothes. In the final darshan of Krishna, the, when he's put to sleep, they put the clothes of Radha next to him suggesting that there is Radha there. Even for instance in the Jagannath temple, uh, there is no Radha. And Radha there comes through the chanting of Jaidev's Gita Govind. Because Jaidev started the tradition of chanting. When we talk of Radha, we must also talk about the whole epistemology of Vera or longing. The uh, concept of longing is brought in also in the Bhagavad. For instance, uh, the Godhuli Veda, when Krishna returns with the cows at the end of the day, but Krishna is gone for the day and the gopis long for him, where has he gone? So even in that few hours, there is that feeling of Veraha uh, for the gopis. And then of course, that intense Veraha comes in after the uh, Rasalila ends. Because don't forget, again, to go back to the Bhagavad. At the end of the Rasalila, 
Krishna leaves Vrindavan, never to come back again. Although, mind you, Chaitanya and some others change that, but not in the Bhagavad. The Bhagavad, Krishna does not return. Why did? Why was the story construed that way? Very simply, to bring in the concept of Viraha and to very simply bring in the whole essence of Advaita. That unless there is Viraha or that intense Nongi, you are not able to move from Shringar to Shringar Bhakti. See, as long as Krishna is in front of you, playing, romancing, dallying, playing his flute uh, in Vrindavan, uh, you are in the position of Shringar. You don't want to lose him. You want him to be in front of you. You want to touch him, to be sensuously involved with him all the time. And therefore, at that point, there cannot be bhakti. You are just totally involved with him. Romance is too strong, too exciting, uh, too pleasurable at that point. It's just sensual enjoyment of Krishna. And that's the way he wants it. Krishna very clearly says that please enjoy me sensuously through my song, through my dance, through my words, through my gestures, through my clothes, and whatever I wear and so on. I mean, his whole appearance in the Bhagavad, with the Pitamba, the Vanmala, the peacock feathers, all very suggestive metaphors. Uh, it's not accidentally done. So, at the end of the Rasa Leela, when Krishna leaves, and the Kofis are in a state of utter painful longing, and first initially with great anguish, anger, despair, uh, and it is only when Uddhav comes carrying a message from Krishna, who wants to know, please find out how the Kofis are doing, I'm thinking of them. It is then that they really realize that they don't need Krishna in front of them. Krishna is within them. The flute is heard within them. And that is where really Shringar Ras becomes Shringar Bhakti. So am I saying that you need that sense of longing to develop Bhakti? I'd have to say yes. There can be a different kind of bhakti when the icon, the idol, or the person is in front of you. But real Sringar bhakti can only come because of longing and viraha. Because it changes the way you look upon your beloved at that point. And therefore, of course, Jaidev also brings in viraha, but on both sides. Jaidev brings in the viraha of Radha and viraha of Krishna both. But Chaitanya then picks up on the Vira idea also. Because we as Sakhi, uh, who are not privy to being with Krishna, because Krishna can only be Virada. So we are sort of removed from Krishna uh, in that, in Gaudiya Vaishnavism. And therefore we have that intense longing for Krishna. And it is in that longing that Sringar is transformed into Shringar Bhakti. Chaitanya also says that any Shringar does not necessarily lead to Shringar Bhakti. It is only Shringar of Krishna that leads to or is transformed into Shringar Bhakti, where sensuality is transformed into spirituality, where uh, the objective Krishna disappears in front of us and it is only the subjective Krishna that remains with us. And therefore, Shringar becomes Shringar Bhakti. And it is that that really sustains the whole Shringar Rasa. Because you do know that some people and some very prominent people in 19th century India, like Raja Ram Mohan Roy, felt that the Tashama Skanda should be confined to the flames. Because it is a very decadent text according to them. Now obviously, if you are stuck at a sensuous level, if you are not able to transform Shringar into Shringar Bhakti, uh, there is always that danger that it will 
from sensuality, it could become, would become profane, it could become lewd. Uh, there is always that danger of Shrinkaras, which, of course, Chaitanya does very nicely. And that is the contribution of Chaitanya, one of his main contributions. That uh, we are not privy to Krishna, and therefore there is no Shrinkara Sada, but automatically this is Shrinkara Bhakti. And that, of course, then goes through uh, the centuries, and then did we come to modern times, where then Radha is looked upon as Krishna Bhakta and so on. But then in times modern, the whole texture and the character of Radha changes. Radha becomes too flat in contemporary times and modern times. Uh, and, and in art, in feeling, in, in everything, in stories, in narratives, in Bollywood, Radha becomes a, a kind of a two-dimensional character. That mythic, mystical character of Radha disappears. Uh, but again, to restate, the, it is, the Viraha is the backbone, is the underpinning of Shrindar Rasta. Unless there is Viraha, uh, Shrindar Rasta does not move on to Shrindar Bhakti. So that is the importance of Viraha. And what you are saying about, um, in a sense, Radha's character um, embodies this movement from Shringara Rasa to Shringara Bhakti, Correct. or is made to in the way that her character develops over time. And uh, I find it in interesting what you're saying, and this brings us also to the visual semantics, because um, when you say, is it a question of the medium? Because poetry is so multidimensional, and so her poetic character can be so multidimensional. And then when she's transformed into the, uh, let's say, the miniature paintings, and it becomes almost 2D, and then even if you take that onto screen, it's still just, you know, it loses that multidimensionality. But um, just the changing character and how then maybe the medium or the visual semantics has played a role in also shaping her character. Could I you? think you've said it very well. Um, but Jayadeva had no idea whatsoever that the Gita Govinda and therefore Radha and Krishna could be converted to painting. The miniature painting as we know it today did not exist at the time of Jayadeva. Uh, otherwise he would have either commented or, or done something different. Uh, Miniature painting comes a couple of hundred years later than, than Jaideva. And as you very rightly say, when you change the medium in which Radha is celebrated, Radha is essentially Kavyamaya. That is how Jaideva brings it in. That is how he celebrates Radha. Uh, but Chaitanya makes it into a theology. He moves away from romantic poetry. But by that time, Radha had started appearing very strongly in miniature paintings. And therefore, as you correctly said, when you depict Radha in painting, how do you bring in that spiritual aspect of Radha? Now, that's a very interesting question, that's a very important question, that uh, different artists would use different techniques to show the longing of Radha. Uh, and, and make it more spiritual. And that is why I think it is very important that miniature painting be always enjoyed with tandem with poetry. The whole concept of holding up a miniature painting in a book or in a print or in a museum and just looking at it uh, changes the whole character of the, of the whole narrative. Uh, but if you, the whole ideal way of enjoying the miniature painting, because which is where she appears strongly over 500 years, from roughly the 15th to the 19th century, 500 years of, of, of very rich representations of Radha in most of the Rajput courts uh, in Gujarat, in Malwa, uh, and then in the Pahdi areas. But one should go back and think about how were these miniature paintings enjoyed. Imagine a court swari in the evening where the patron, the Raja is sitting and next to him uh, the poet would sit, the actual poet, for instance in the case of Keshav Das who wrote Rasika Priya, uh, we know that Keshav Das would preside along with Radha in Indrajit in Orcha and he would recite poetry. 
but in the absence of the actual poet, some other poet would recite the poetry. And then there would be a dancer, there would be a singer, and the dancer and the singer would enact that whole couplet or, or the Ashtapadi. And then there would be the court librarian who would explain the whole thing to the artist. And it is only then that the paintings would be created. So we who are just looking at the painting 500 years later, 1000 years later, uh, we must recreate that in our own mind to enjoy the painting. Which again brings me back to what you've said that uh, the painting as such loses a, a, another dimension altogether and rather becomes rather flat. And it is only through painting and its possible depiction, in, uh, only through poetry and its depiction and painting, uh, that the whole concept of longing and kara and bhakti really comes in. And therefore, which brings me back to what I've said before, that one must enjoy paintings uh, the, or the entire character of Radha, along with the paintings, the poetry, the narratives, the song, and the dance, and so on. Enjoying just one piece of art by itself is likely to give you a very truncated, a very one unidimensional view of art. And uh, so, what I was just thinking was that what's very fascinating about Radha is it's almost like her character inverses Hindu philosophy from Tattvamasi to I am you. Like she's like boldly stating she's almost she's understood that there is no separation. So it goes from you are that to it's like the it's like the bhakta speaking. All the time when the texts speak to you, we understand it, but she's embodying the philosophy and then expressing her understanding of it. Do you think that would be probably uh, one way of looking at her? Like, and that's why people connect to her character so much because she gives us uh, a, a, a way of expressing um, our understanding of oneness. I think you've said it very beautifully. But uh, I would only say it, that when Advaita changes to Advaita, uh, this is exactly what happens. That both the subject and the object are equally important uh, in that relationship. The romance of Shiva and Parvati is a mirror image of the romance of Radha and Krishna. In the Shiva-Parvati romance, Shiva is the subject, Parvati is the object and Shiva is in love with Parvati and it is Parvati who eventually transforms Shiva and brings knowledge. In this case, in the case of Radha and Krishna, it is the Radha who is the subject and Krishna is the object of love. And something quite different happens in the Radha-Krishna model as it were that Radha then becomes knowledge itself because of Krishna. Uh, whereas in the case of Shiva and Parvati, it is Shiva who is the abode of knowledge. And therefore what you're saying is so true that uh, Radha epitomizes a whole different way of understanding knowledge. Uh, that it is through the persona, the love of Krishna, that Radha becomes knowledgeable or full of knowledge herself. I think that is one very interesting way of looking at it. And maybe then also the bhakti poetry and um, the uh, sort of how she is depicted in folk cultures, is that very different then from the way uh, the miniature depictions and is there like, are there, there are multiple Radhas in a sense? You see, in folk culture, in tribal culture in particular, uh, Radha is a very robust and a kind of an aggressive character. Uh, and I think that some of it one sees in Jaidev's Geet Govind. Because obviously Jaidev must have been privy to a lot of folk and tribal poetry and so on. And yes, I quite agree that in folk and tribal poetry, Radha comes through very differently, very strongly, very robustly, very aggressively. Uh, and is very confident of her love. Uh, there is no question of her being uh, inhibited or diffident about her love. She's sure about her love for Krishna. Uh, 
um, and asserts it and, and is firmly rooted in that love. Uh, and I think that's a character of the folk tradition. The folk tradition uh, lacks that inhibition. Uh, it's very outward, it's very robust, it's very expressive. Uh, and even today in the tribal societies in present day, uh, the whole relationship between a man and a woman, uh, one sees that, but a woman is extremely uh, confident, outward, and, 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 uh, and not shy, and coy, and so on. Uh, and, and yes, so therefore I certainly agree that when you look at the folk traditions, which one must in, in understanding Radha, particularly the older folk traditions, uh, but then what happens in the so-called calendar art uh, and the popular songs of Radha and Krishna? There again, uh, see, there again, there is that ambivalence. If you look at Hindi literature, uh, with which I'm slightly familiar, uh, the different poets bring in Radha in a different way. Radha, in Riti Kavya, and, and, and the father of Riti Kavya is Keshav Das, uh, 1591 is his date. Uh, Keshav Das creates a courtly Radha, not the Radha of Rindava, not the Radha of the forest, the Koi, not the Radha of the folk uh, poetry, but altogether new Radha comes in there. And that is the Radha of Rasikapriya, which is the creation of, of Keshav Das, followed by almost four, five hundred years of Riti Kavya, or a couple of, at least three hundred years of Riti Kavya. Because uh, there was Keshav Das, there was Bihari, there was Matiram, and a host of other poets who bring in the courtly Radha, the Radha of the courts. Now there she's different. She's also there in love with Krishna, uh, but she's more assertive. She's not the coy, the newer Radha of the forest. And that really, it is the Riti Kavya then takes us to the Radha of modern poetry. And I think there, as it were, as you said very nicely, there is the rural Radha which is also comes in, in poetry. But there is the kind of an urban, more assertive Radha, uh, who says, well look, I'm not going to wait for you forever, <laughs> tells Krishna that. Uh, if you want, you can come, otherwise, otherwise don't, things like that. So there's that modern, should I use the word feminist Radha that comes in. Uh, and in Kolkata, yet another trend comes in, where Radha becomes a Kalankini, where uh, she's portrayed as the kind of fallen in the bad woman who lures men away from their marriages and breaks up marriages and so on. And there's a very interesting uh, poetic reference to that where uh, there is Radha along with her friends. This is uh, situated in Bengal. And she wants to become the Abhisarika, leave in the middle of the night to meet Krishna. Uh, and the other friends ask her, saying, where are you going? in the middle of the night. So she is startled and scared. So what is she going to say? So she, because she is a Bengali woman in, in that narrative, she said, oh, I'm going to worship Kali in the middle of the night. And Krishna, who was waiting for her in the forest, uh, realizes what has happened, of course. And uh, Krishna changes his whole appearance to that of Kali, uh, except that he looks a little blue uh, and a little, some of his peacock feathers still remain. Uh, so there's some confusion there, but the situation is saved for that Radha. But there that Radha Kalankini comes in in Kolkata quite a lot in uh, some of Bengali poetry. So there we are from that seminal Radha in the Bhagavad Puran without naming to the strong presence of Radha in the Geet Govind to the suggested Radha again in Pushti Bhag Vaishnavism, the Ashtachap Kavis. Mind you, there also she is a little late in appearance. Surdas 
initially did not talk much about Radha, but it is because of Vithalnath, Vallabhacharya's son, that he starts talking about Radha. And then, of course, Gaudiya, Rasika Priya, uh, the courtly Radha, and then in Radha and folk literature, then, of course, in cinema and so on. So, she's a marvelous character. Uh, she sort of tantalizes us. Uh, and therefore, that quote, the little poem that I wrote, ah, who are you, after all, Radha, who are you? Which incidentally is a takeoff from Vidyapati. Uh, Vidyapati was another poet who is called the second Jaideva in Mithila. And he writes very lovingly of Radha. He had the heart of Radha, it is said. Uh, and he writes this saying, who, uh, he writes this poem in, in, the, in, the, in the words of Radha, saying, asking Krishna, who are you after all, who are you Krishna? So I just turned it around and said, who are you Radha? So I think that we should, could end this in introduction with that question saying, who are you really Radha, who are you? We need to think about it.